Okay, um, good morning, uh, exciting session. And uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, collaborators in this work. Uh, it's led by Adeline Bichet, who you hear from uh, uh, in, um, I guess, uh, tomorrow. And uh, other uh, collaborators include Lawrence Mudrick, who uh, is working with me at uh, the University of Toronto, Laurent Tere, and uh, John Fife. So um, this is work that uh, I think dovetails nicely with uh, Matt's talk, talk to some extent. And um, I'd like to uh, kind of go over what, what is really a kind of a simulation protocol, and we're just, we're developing it now. This is work in progress. Um, and so over the course of the talk, I will talk about the, uh, the use of prescribed SSTs, AMIP type simulations, to uh, predict continental hydroclimate trends. Um, and uh, a pattern scaling based method that we've uh, developed that we're still working on that we'd like feedback on uh, to, uh, to extract the force component of climate change, the long term global warming. Um, and uh, we're, I'm going to show you some applications on past uh, re recent climate uh, trends and uh, Adeline will uh, share with you some results related to projected climate. Okay, whoops. That seems. <laughs> That seems rather, rather abrupt. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> all right. So um, to start with, I just wanted to take us back to a basic point that if you uh, feed a, an atmospheric general circulation model ob observed uh, oceanic boundary conditions, so observed SSTs, um, and uh, you also throw in sea ice as well, that um, you can do a very good job at reproducing uh, uh, trends that have been observed over the continental region. So this is a, a figure taken from a paper by Shin and Sardashmuk showing in the top panel uh, observed uh, uh, temperature trends over land uh, in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and then the ensemble mean from several AMIP uh, simulations where all, SS, all uh, SSTs are prescribed globally. Um, from uh, the CMIP-3 uh, generation of uh, models, but these are atmospheric GC GCMs. So um, if you, and, and you can also get the same kind of result, or at least part of it, if you, uh, if you prescribe just tropical SSTs. So a way to quantify that is using a Taylor diagram, um, which were introduced in the last talk. But so a Taylor diagram shows the, uh, on the polar angle here, indicates the uh, degree of correlation with some target. So the target here is, observed uh, land surface temperature trends, the pattern of that. And this is, uh, these are three observational estimates. So this is the, the, uh, the target here is the, the mean of these three observational estimates. And over here in blue are a bunch of uh, results from an AMIP simulation. So this is the CMIP3 generation of models. Um, in green as well, we, there's, the, uh, there's ones in which uh, the trop only the tropical SSTs have been prescribed. Um, but if you look at coupled models, you can see that coupled models uh, over the same period have had a, have a really difficult time at reproducing the pattern of observed trends. Um, and so there's no, th th this is kind of a ruling out internal variability to some extent as a cause of this disagreement because all the none of the coupled models from that period were really able to capture it to the extent that any of the uh, ones with, uh, with, uh, with uh, prescribed glo uh, global SSTs. So because of that connection, um, we know that there's a lot of useful information in the ocean uh, for continental climate. And, and the dynamical causes, is, as, as Matt, Matt was saying, it, I, I'd say it's unclear to me, but I think if you wait, if you take a long enough time history of ocean SSTs, you can get kind of good agreement with, uh, with, with OBS over, over land. So exploiting that connection is an interesting idea, I think. And so what we're trying to do, uh, understand is whether we can get additional ends insight from the observed history of SSTs. Okay, so one of the challenges in this and one of the interesting points is to try to separate out um, internal and short-term uh, variability that's driven by anthropogenic forcing from a long-term trend. Um, so what I'm going to uh, explore here today are two questions about whether we can estimate the long-term variability associated with the global warming, so just taking the global radiative forcing as kind of a target, uh, try to extract that from observations, and then uh, whether we can use that information uh, to gain insight into past trends and maybe uh, use it to for, uh, predict the force component of climate change in the future. So our method here, uh, it's, uh, it, it's a somewhat complicated slide, but basically the idea is pattern scaling. So um, in the top, uh, uh, top equation here, what we do is we take um, a, 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 an SST uh, field or a sea ice field and we uh, decompose it uh, notionally into a long-term uh, slowly varying part, which we call GW for global warming, and a short-term part, which could include internal variability and also any response to short-term forcing, such as anthropogenic aerosols, volcanoes, um, and, and ozone, for example, ozone-depleting uh, substances. 
Um, and uh, the very simple idea here, the simplest idea is that there's a stationary pattern, uh, which we call H of, as a function of X. Um, and that stationary pattern is scaled by the global mean temperature, an estimate uh, called what we should call G of T. And um, you can make various choices in how, how to carry out these estimates. And I'll, I'll show some evidence that we're on the right track. But uh, basically, we've done two things. And in a, a publication that's out in Journal of Climate, uh, we estimated G of T from, um, from observations, from, uh, from uh, long-term observation, SST observations. So that's the global mean surface temperature. Um, and in the recent work, we're actually using the uh, estimate from, uh, C, from uh, CMIP-5, because we're going into the future. Uh, and H of X is just a simple regression, uh, basically uh, a trend pattern that's uh, taken from your observational data set of choice. Okay, so we, we, in, the, in the previous work, we looked at the sensitivity of our results to various uh, uh, estimates of this global mean surface temperature. Uh, but basically, we, we hit on a, a, a simple, uh, slowly varying, slightly nonlinear trend that, that uh, goes through the global mean SSTs, and that's what we're calling G of T. So in this, in this sense, H of X, which is the pattern, of SST and sea ice is the regression of this curve on observations, its projection. So I claim that this is actually a method that we can quantify to some extent um, how, how well we're doing. And what we do is we turn to a large initial condition ensembles. We have a few of those at our disposal uh, to test the idea of whether uh, we are actually extracting uh, the long-term force component of climate change. So we have the ensemble mean of, the, uh, of, of a large, large initial condition ensemble to use um, as, a, as a kind of filtering of internal variability. Uh, and from that, we can compare the patterns of H of X from that ensemble mean to the individual H of, H of X's that we get from, uh, from this method. Um, and this shows the pattern correlation. It's one test we've applied is the pattern correlation uh, between individual uh, H of X's extracted in, in, in this uh, model setting uh, to the ensemble mean. And uh, this is testing the sensitivity to model types. So we, hear, we do it here over a 45-year period with CCSM4, with CESM1, the next generation model. Uh, and then we extend the period here. And you can see that as you, as you increase the period, not surprisingly, uh, you get a better agreement uh, between uh, the estimate and the, uh, the final result. And we've done a bit more of this in a, in a, more, a more recent work where we've extended the period further to 2012. Uh, we've done some other adjustments to the method. So we have a sense now that we can capture about 70% of the observed pattern if we, uh, if we believe that there is some correspondence between the, uh, the, the coupled model test bed and, and observations. Um, however, we're not using the coupled model for those patterns. I just want to emphasize that, that the pattern is coming from, from observations. Is that clear? by the way, because <laughs> this is important. If you don't, if it, 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 it's important to kind of understand it at this stage. All right. So what we actually get then um, is, is shown, uh, the most important result I think is shown on the right. So on the left, I'm showing 30 year trends of uh, sea surface temperatures from the, from the recent period, 1980 to 2010. Okay. Um, and on the right, I'm showing the, uh, what we're calling SGW. Okay. It's a global warming pattern. And this, this is the long term trend basically in uh, SSTs predominantly warming, smoother, there's no, you, there's no AMO, there's no PDO signal. It's just taking the, 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 the long-term record, this is from the HURL SSTs, so you might ask you know, what happens when you vary uh, SST data sets, but this is what we're using for convenience for now. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the structure that we associate with internal modes of variability or with short-term responses uh, to, to short-lived uh, short, uh, short forcers um, is, is smoothed out, okay? So we think that this is an interesting pattern. It's a much broader pattern. There's much less uh, structure in the tropical Pacific. Um, and we want to use this to drive uh, AGCMs and, and, and see what happens. So uh, before I get show you that, this is the similar pattern from sea ice, okay? So we take the, the sea ice product that's contained in the HURL data set, which is conveniently uh, in, our, uh, in, in our model. We're using the NCAR CAM model, and so this is easy to do. So the, the, this is the sea ice that's coherent with that um, uh, pattern scaled, uh, so that with that scaling factor G of T. Um, and you see that the recent uh, you know, large sea ice loss that's uh, seen in different, uh, different seasons, particularly in the summer, Arctic summer, um, is, is reduced if you just draw a, basically a long-term trend line through that, through that rapid sea ice loss. So that's what we're using to force the sea ice in this model. Okay, so now we're going to apply and practice this, uh, this pattern of warming and uh, this pattern of sea ice loss. Uh, in CAM5, we uh, run a coarse resolution two degree mo uh, model. We've done 10 ensembles of two types, okay? So these are 30 year runs. 
We have a, an AMIP run, which is uh, observed SSTs, the time varying history of, of, the, of the SSTs and sea ice. And then we, we uh, run we call, a set of runs we call GW, which is our estimate of the forced um, SST change. And we're using that to, to uh, force the full AGCM. And we're looking out over the continents at what, what's happening there. Okay, um, and so what I'm going to show you is a few results from these simulations. Um, and we're looking at, we're going to, we're, we're cherry picking here. We're looking for variables and, and, and seasons where there's agreement between the AMIP runs and the uh, observations. Um, and and that's, so AMIP runs are not guaranteed to reproduce observations uh, in, in all cases. So we're, we're going to focus on those regions. And also, uh, we can, none of the trends we find in these short runs, the 30 years, they, most of them tend to be uh, in, insignificant because we fo tend to focus on mid latitudes, although I'll show you one tropical result. Um, but we, if we do these runs over and over again, we find that uh, we often get consistent responses. So uh, in regions that are not shaded in gray in the figures that follow, that means that we have uh, 10 runs and the signal to noise in those runs represent it, which is the ratio of the response to the standard deviation of the 10 members uh, is, is greater than one. Okay, so I'll start with uh, surface temperature, always a, a nice reliable field to start with. So this is wintertime surface temperature trends um, from CRU, uh, from these AMIP runs that we've done, and from the uh, global warming uh, pattern we've imposed, okay? So what's interesting to us here is the correspondence between AMIP and CRU, um, and so it looks, looks like the AMIP runs are getting a pretty good uh, match, you know, in, in several of the features to what we've seen in observations. Uh, this is not too observationally uh, dependent, or set observation uh, set dependent. Um, and uh, what you see, a pattern of warming, uh, cooling over northwestern North America, warming here in the southeast in the, in the winter. Um, and in the global, uh, in this GW run, we are, uh, we're, we're seeing basically that this cooling spot is removed. Okay, so this, this has been uh, reasonably attributed to uh, the PDO trend that I showed in a, a previous slide. And this, this uh, uh, GW run helps uh, quantify that. And then in, the, in this warming run, you see the warming is shifted uh, into the central Eurasia from where it's, uh, where it's been observed more or less. Um, and so we can attribute some of this to internal variability to the PDO uh, var uh, variations. And then of course cause and effect is, uh, is hard to, 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 to get out of these runs, um, but it is a, a kind of, I think it get, does give us insight into uh, separate part, what, what, what you can attribute to short term variability versus to the long term uh, in inexorable kind of warming that's been going on. Okay, now we're focusing on winter precipitation. This project is actually, uh, uh, ha has been uh, largely funded by a, a Canadian network called CANSICE, where we focus on snow and sea ice uh, uh, variability and, uh, in, and uh, modeling in, in uh, uh, the Canadian setting. And so um, I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, figures related to that. This is wintertime precipitation, okay? Um, and uh, I think the, the AMIP runs actually here do a, a pretty nice job of capturing uh, what, we, what we're seeing in observations. And so there, you, know, you can get a sense that we can attribute the recent trends to, uh, at, to, observe, to the SSTs, we, uh, SST variability. Uh, and the global warming run has, shows very, very weak trends over this uh, period. And there's a, so there's a little bit of uh, uh, drying that's uh, seen in the, um, on the west coast of North America. And so the difference here is really highlighting that. So much of what, we, what we're saying here is that much of these trends are, 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 re represent the re result of short-term forcing and uh, internal variability. Um, uh, this is a, a picture of a snow cover fraction. As I said, uh, Cansice is, is really focused on that. And so uh, up here, we're, I'm showing a couple of observational estimates of recent trends in snow cover, which is highly observationally uncertain. Um, this is a, a satellite data simulation based uh, estimate uh, called Globe Snow. This is the Amer Amera reanalysis. Um, and, and you can see there's quite a difference in the patterns. So it's worth showing this before I show you any results from, the AMIP, uh, from, from our simulations. So and, uh, and, uh, there's a lot more gray shading here indicating that there's less agreement among the models um, as to uh, exactly how the uh, snow cover fraction will respond uh, to, this, uh, uh, to these changes. Um, however, what you see is that there's this reduction, uh, s uh, snow retreat in the, over Scandinavia, Northern Europe, over, the, over uh, 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 this, the marginal area here. And um, some of that is also found in the, in the same uh, global warming run. So we can attribute a much of this pattern um, to uh, what's, what is uh, an externally forced signal. Um, and the, the, the residual uh, shown here is kind of a, 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 a very noisy pattern. 
Now I'm going to switch. <laughs> this is a sort of final results slide. The, 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 uh, this, is a, this is a global, these are global simulations, and I thought it would be worth sharing, uh, sharing this uh, result as well. Um, so we, if we look over a Africa, which is a, a, a region, uh, so this is summertime um, African precipitation, okay, so j uh, July, August, September. Uh, this uh, recent uh, recovery of uh, precipitation uh, that's been observed over the Sahel uh, is really captured well in the same at Brun, which is uh, certainly something that's been seen, seen before. And I think just for, as a point of information, when we put in the, this global warming pattern which, in which the, there's no, AMO, there's no uh, AMV signal, there's no PDO signal, um, this, this is the response over that 30-year period to the, just that broad warming of SSTs, and we see a drying in West Africa, okay? And the difference between these patterns is, is showing you the result of, of how internal variability and short-term forcing uh, might be compensating what's, what's going on over the very long term uh, with global warming. Okay, so I'm going to uh, summarize. I'm going to show you one more slide, and then I'll conclude. So uh, we've tested and extended. A, I didn't give credit here to where it was due to. Uh, uh, it was an idea that was proposed by uh, Hurling and Hurl and uh, Ture and others uh, to uh, actually do this for, uh, as a method of climate prediction on the on the uh, in the near term uh, to predict the for, the, the uh, force component of climate change um, using this kind of uh, pattern scaling method. Um, and so uh, we, we thought to test this method first, and we've, we have a couple of papers that we're working on uh, with, with that. And so um, I, what I've tried to show you is that we have a reasonable confidence that we can actually estimate this pattern from observations, given a 70-year record of, of SSTs. We can, we can do a reasonable job. It's a very broad pattern, so we might not need a lot of uh, spatial detail to get the general idea. Um, and it seems like there's, that, that there's a good evidence that what we're seeing in North America, uh, there's a lot of the uh, precipitation changes are related to PDO variability, um, and that we can also apply this to other regions such as uh, Sub-Sahel Africa, where we're seeing um, a, a global warming signal that's counter to the, the, recent, tra <clears throat> the recent trends. Um, a question that you might ask is, well, why didn't we use coupled models to do this? Okay, and it goes back to a point I, I, uh, I showed uh, earlier indirectly. Okay, if we, uh, if we try to estimate uh, H of X from coupled models, this is kind of an ensemble mean of, of what we tend to find. But we, often, we tend to find that, that so this is H of X estimated directly from CMIP5, and we tend to get a lot more tropical warming and also a lot of North Atlantic warming that we, we don't see when we do the same estimate and observation. So the difference between these patterns uh, suggests that we should at least try to do this with observations. And so the idea of, of, of uh, near-term projection with this is to persist this pattern into the future, and that's what Adeline will be talking about uh, tomorrow. Okay, so the key points are that uh, we can reliably estimate the observed pattern of long-term uh, of the long-term uh, sea surface temperature response to, to radiative forcing from, from global warming. Um, and this pattern allows us to attribute the uh, uh, related component of past hydroclimate trends, uh, and we're able to use this uh, for future projections, and uh, we're, we're still working on, that, on, on those results. Um, and it's really different from what you'd get if you did the same exercise in, in, in current coupled models. Um, so I would just argue that there's a lot to be gained on uh, understanding uh, forced decadal climate variability from looking at existing SST observations. Thank you.